Welcome and good morning, everyone, and welcome to a webinar from the Payments Association. I'm Tony Craddock, I'm the Director General, and it's a, it's a pleasure and a privilege to be uh, facilitating a discussion on an important topic with you all today. Uh, let me start by, by saying I often, often wonder at the working of His Majesty's government. Um, I, who knows what happened in the months before the Mansion House speech on July the 7th by the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Jeremy Hunt. He stood up in all the grandeur of the official residence of the Lord Mayor of London, and he made what I thought was going to be his normal sort of politically motivated speech. You know, he started as expected and told us he wanted to talk about long-term reforms to our uh, competitors, competitiveness. He, he wanted to talk about the, the immediate challenge of tackling inflation. Uh, he, he spoke about how we must enable our financial services sector to increase returns for pensioners and improve outcomes for investors, even to unlock capital for our growth businesses, all predictable good stuff on pensions and listing and smart regulation. And then, and then he said these magic words. And I want to make sure we remain at the forefront of payments technology. I didn't even know he knew what payments technology was, to be honest with you. But he then said, so I'm launching an independent review into the future of payments led by Joe Garner, to help deliver the next generation of world-class retail payments. At last, at last recognition that payments mattered, acknowledgement that leadership in the thing that made society work was important and that perhaps the government would need to have a, a position on this and look into it. So we were really, really delighted. Now, I don't know why it was now seen as being a priority, what Mr. Hunt had been reading that week or who he'd been, who he'd been talking to or what he'd even had for breakfast, but we, would, we welcomed it as an opportunity, a chance to make our mark and also to make the case, to be heard and allow our concerns and issues around this amazing industry of ours that we know and love and about which we're passionate that could potentially be impacted positively by a, a, a shift um, from, from the government's positioning. So what did we do? We mobilized our resources. We got the community engaged. We, with the help of KPMG and especially Ellie Hewitt on the team there, we did a range of, of, of things. We, we made calls. We did numerous planning meetings. We did a, a member survey with 250 responses. We did something called some in-flight initiative workshops and many calls and meetings with Joe Garner and his team of experts from HMT and the PSR, plus lots of numerous introductions to retailers and e-com merchants from the to the team from Laura McCracken's Little Black Book. So it was really a great community effort. It was probably fortuitous. It was over the summer because it meant all we had to do was cancel our summer holidays. Um, and it meant it possible that by the 30th of September, we were ready to do two things, to look at the four components that he was asking us about um, and to present on two of them. So uh, led by the people on this webinar and produced with the help of our working group members, and project leads with um, Tom uh, Bruin uh, responsible there. Thanks, Tom. We submitted to the community uh, two things. First of all, um, a review of the in-flight initiatives, this wonderful phrase that Joe came up with in his briefing to us, a review of what's currently happening in payments um, and what's going well, what's going less well, and what's not going so well and we need to do differently in future. And we publish this uh, to our members. You can find it online or through your member engagement executive. We also published something that Ricardo, my head of policy and government relations, has been urging us to do ever since he went to the political party conferences in, 2000 and in 2022, um, the, the Payments Manifesto. We managed to produce this over a short period of time, but it produced 38 versions, continuously iterating, iterating and improving. And today, what we want to share with you is our community's belief as to what we think should be in the report that Joe Garner's team produces on the future of payments review. Now, sadly, we cannot tell you what's in it because we don't know. But what we do know is what we think should be in it because our members have told us. So that's my preamble to this webinar. You're more than welcome. I invite you to be here engaged. I invite you to put your phones on airplane mode. Uh, I invite you to turn your second screen off and really listen in. I'm going to introduce the, the members of the, of the panel in just a minute. Um, a few things. Your job is to think of some really great searching questions for them and to put them in the Q&A. You can submit questions by just popping them into the Q&A tab on the control panel. 
You can send your questions at any time. The speakers will address them during the Q&A session at the end. We're going to aim for about 20 minutes of Q&A at the end. Um, you can ask them anonymously if you prefer, but we'd prefer you to put your name by them so we can textualize the answers. If you have any technical issues, feel free to send a uh, message through the chat to Christina Gatins at, uh, at the Payment Association, and she'll do her best to answer them. So let's crack on. What should be in the future of payments review? So welcome to our panelists. Uh, we're just going to pop our uh, um, videos on. You should be able to see our gloriously charming faces um, uh, right, fairly soon. Um, and we're going to start with Paul, Paul Horrock, Chief Payments Officer of Santander UK, um, a man who likes a, 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 to be on both sides of the fence, from bank side to regulator side, and a man who likes a fine stake. He's going to start by talking about what should be in the future of payments review from the point of view of financial crime. Uh, Paul, over to you. Thanks, Tony. Uh, thanks for the uh, as ever, wonderful introduction. Um, look, this is a really interesting time, as you said. This was a surprise for this to appear in the, in the speech, and we've all been running around furiously to make sure we can get some great advice into Joe through through the process. Financial crime is just one of the dimensions of payments that, that, that I'm involved in, it's, and it's one that, that taxes us all on a, on a daily basis. And I think contextualising it is really important. I think we did that with Joe as part of the conversation. So we need to remember that Customer payments accounted for about 86% of the payments last year in the UK. And those payments were about 40 billion, north of 40 billion pounds worth of payments in the UK made. Um, and, and the other 14% are business payments. And faster payments, backed payments, well, fast payments particularly are growing every year. I think we saw faster payments and backed compliance was about 8.6 trillion pounds worth of payments that, that went through last year. And in that faster payments area in particular, we see the scourge of APP scams. And any of us in banks are obsessed with trying to help our customers in this challenge today. It's, it's a big issue. And, and the question was, are we focusing on the right things? Is the, is the re report going to talk about the right things? I think what we found is we're all focusing on the customer, right? Everything that's going on is trying to help the customer. The challenge that we have is whether we're all coming at it from an angle that helps with the final outcome. Now in 2022, there was around 1.2 billion pounds stolen in the APP scam activity. I mean, just need to think about that for a moment, 1.2 billion pounds of unauthorized fraud, or actually authorized and unauthorized fraud that went through the APP process. And for us, we need to remember as a bank, we've seen that nearly 60% of the activity was lost due to purchase scams. Now, Purchase scams is quite a neat, it's quite a big catch-all, but but let's be frank. We know that a large majority of payments that are affected in this issue are through social media marketplaces. So it's really important that we understand that end-to-end -end process that occurs that customers go through to make those payments. And the CEOs of the largest banks wrote to the Prime Minister actually urging the government to take further steps to combat this devastating impact that fraud is having on people. People and the, and the letter talks about how. Online fraud poses a strategic threat to the prosperity of the UK economy. And we want to make sure that the report focuses on how to deal with the entire journey. And if you look at what we've put in the manifesto, the, the commentary we've made to the, the review is we really want to ensure that large, large techs are into this conversation. They, they are bought into that need to look after our customer all the way through the decisions and the conversations they're having through these purchase journeys. And at the moment, large tech is not regulated in the same way as banks. And it often leads to uneven or uh, unreconcilable incentives in the way that customers are provided for. The concern that we have, particularly from a bank perspective, is that the latest regulatory efforts to share the burden between sender and receiver may seek to create equity between the financial institutions, but they don't in any way deal with the whole value chain in the way that these APP scams are perpetrated. And there's often, and then we think there's also a perverse incentive in that activity that it could drive some of the smaller institutions out of this activity because you know, they're not in a, a strong enough position to deal with some of the impact of that, of that burden share. And I would recommend actually, and I said to, to Tony earlier, a number of us were, were, were very fortunate to listen to a speech earlier this week by David Postings, who, who's the CEO of UK Finance, talking about this particular issue. And one of the concerns we have is that, that protection isn't all about 
reimbursement. Protection is protecting customers all the way through their activity. And the concern that, that, that just reimbursing and actually putting the, the burden of risk upon the banks doesn't actually protect customers in the long term. It doesn't protect the economy in the long term. And we need to make sure that we can start to give full protection, understand exactly how payments are made and are, are, are authorised through that activity. So what we're really keen to see in the report is a recognition of the reality of the situation, a, uh, a need to bring everybody into the conversation that needs to be in that and into the regulatory sphere that impacts customers, impacts the outcomes of fraud and drive to a better outcome that protects customers and protects the institutions that are involved in driving the UK economy. Brilliant. Brilliant. Here, here. I would second what you just said there, Paul. Thank you very much. A great opening on financial crime. Uh, financial inclusion, something our community cares a great deal about. Um, we've often talked about this being about simple access to payment accounts. I'd like to in, in, invite Peter Harmston, who's from um, uh, from KPMG, uh, but he's also in Cornwall at the moment on holiday. And I'm not going to ask him to stand up because guarantee he's, he's stand, sitting in a, in a pair of Bermuda shorts. Peter, over to you on financial inclusion. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Tony. And um, yes, I, I won't be standing up just yet. Um, so I really think financial inclusion really, really, really underpins a lot of the topics I think we're going to be talking about uh, today, Tony. Um, within crime, which Paul just talked about, currencies, digital currencies, cross-border, open banking. And I really want to continue, what I want to see is, is continue to turn the dial on financial inclusion to ensure um, those services and go going beyond transaction accounts and payments for the consumers and for businesses continues to be progressive. Um, digital first approach, but ensuring the impact of this is it continues the evolution, but includes inclusivity, affordability, and access. And I kind of want to touch briefly on there's many things we can talk about that I want to see coming out of the view, but I just want to touch on three quick areas, um, Tony. Um, firstly, is a I'd love to see a a stronger policy around customer-led data sharing, especially uh, between in the area of um, AI-powered debt and money advice, allowing for more of the, the non-traditional providers to offer some, some really early intervention tools. In today's market, we talk about it a lot, rising interest rates, increased cost of living. It's even more appropriate to enable customers to get tailored support from non from non-traditional players to help them manage their debt and make those really, those informed financial decisions. And the, the current kind of PFM and the money comparison sites are, are, are great examples of that. And you're probably a number of you know that, that Apple has also um, announced, uh, you know, when you start double click on your Apple Pay, um, there'll be the ability to, to also show your balance at that point as well. Which again, it's just a small step to give people that choice about their spending. The second area I really like to see more more focus on is is some of the some of the kind of regulatory reviews in in the use of data and financial services, especially around affordability checks, and driving driving innovation and products and services that really match the the flexibility we have in the modern the modern work and that kind of different streams of income we have coming in. Um, we've got kind of a generational shift, and you know, Gen Z, which um, certainly isn't isn't me, um, are looking to are looking around a portfolio of skills now that results in um, different contracts, different income streams, etc., um, which really requires you know institutions to come up with innovative ways to be able to, to to track their affordability, and we need to have that ability to create those products and services for that. The last bit I think around financial inclusion, which again is you know utopia, but I really hope it does come out, is I'd love to see the, the government creating a, a universal um, credit sandbox. Um, so we can that innovators can use and build new products and services without the need for government commissioning. Um, and by the government creating this um, sandbox and opening up to innovators, this will allow you know, TPPs to create bespoke propositions, can support individuals in identifying kind of eligible criteria to allow them to, to manage their funds, especially for those, for those, those lower income households. And this is potential to, to really support change for the greater good. And I really think it's going to be a win-win situation for everybody if we can do that in, in, in place. And I think finally, Tony, I think underpinning this and around the financial inclusion 
is the need for really ongoing consumer education, thought leadership, and collaboration across the whole ecosystem, um, media, policymakers, and to really continue to promote the inclusivity of design um, that goes beyond just, just payment services. Yeah, and I especially love that last point about consumer education. Um, and and where there's a, currently a um, uh, a petition going around uh, the, the, the news wires. I'm hoping that people can click on it and, and request that this becomes raised in government uh, and it's promoted by Go Henry. So let's go on to the next thing. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, let's go on to the next thing um, with my our head of... Uh, uh, head of Policy and Government Relations, Ricardo, who's back from the party conferences. Um, uh, Ricardo, let's talk about digital currencies. Um, you know, what, what, what We know that some secondary legislation coming through. Talk to us about what we think should be in the uh, future of payments review to do with digital currencies, please. Excellent. Thank you very much, Tony. And uh, well, sharing the, the, the honour of the crystal ball is never really easy because we don't know what's going to happen. But I think that there are sufficient talks that mm, let us be quite um, optimistic for the future, and particularly because of the recognition that payments are, are having amongst both parties, I must say, not just the government, but uh, also the opposition. There's increasing attention to, to this industry and to the development of it. So touching on, uh, on the digital currencies, as you were asking, I think that we can see that we've moved very far away from, you know, just the panic of the risks of the volatility of all of these new tools. Mm -hmm. And there is a much more sensible approach. Uh, we've seen also other legislations moving towards the same kind of direction of travel. And in the UK, we've seen how, uh, despite having been second movers, because we've seen Mika first coming from the EU, uh, the government is quite committed to make sure that it delivers on the ambition of becoming a global uh, crypto assets um, technology hub. This is very important because it gives us the opportunity of having enough of similarities with neighborhood legislations, but also having like a sort of different approach that can effectively uh, let the UK leading in the, in the standardization of these new um, emerging technologies that they use for payments. And we can see it in, in the approach, right? So we've seen that despite having been the second ones to move, we now have a quite agile framework that should let us uh, come back at first um, into, the, in, into the scene. And if everything goes as planned, we've got 12 months uh, since the kickoff that was started by the Financial Services Market Bill that became an, a, a, um, an act in July, throughout all of this secondary uh, legislation tools. We've seen the first ones coming in with the financial promotion regime. That's like uh, a, a news. It came uh, into force on the 8th of October. And then the month before in September, we'd seen the travel rule. So even if we have a different approach uh, on the authorizations, like we know we do not have an authorization system, we have a registration system uh, followed by uh, other um, this, this financial promotion that basically imposes that whoever gives financial promotion has to be registered. So it's quite a different approach, quite complicated. But through this, we can see that everything is coming uh, towards the next. What what's next could be or should be stable coins. I think this is the, the big hope that everyone in the industry has to see stable coins um, on which the treasury has been consulting for a while. So we hope that there has been enough uh, thinking and uh, thought leadership on this that we can come out with a great stable coins regime that can attract more stable coin issuers into the UK. So I think this is the big hope in the first uh, in the shorter term and then the second term will be moving on uh, in the conversation on the digital pound and CBDCs more globally this is a global topic of course but um, we hope that CBDCs will be mentioned in the future of payments review and and hopefully will be seen as a catalyst for the future of payments in the UK as well. Very good, thank you. It's a very nice uh, encapsulation of, of, the, of the main the main activities and, and what we're going to be seeing ahead. So fantastic. And we're going to pop back to Peter now. Um, uh, being, being working for an advisory firm, he has to do twice the work of everybody else. So it's his turn to talk a little bit about open banking, finance and data and, and providing this alternative uh, rails access and enhanced data attached to transactions. Peter, over to you on open banking. 
Thanks, uh, and thanks, Tony. Thanks for having me here. Uh, having me twice. Um, so, so I think it's important <laughs> with with, with, with uh, uh, open banking, finance, and data just to set the scene um, a little bit where where we are. Um, this is a very uh, talked about talked about topic. So obviously, J Rock's in place, doing significant amount of work um, on the six work streams to really define the next phase phase of open banking in the UK. I think if we kind of be honest with ourselves, the UK was considered, I think, a, a global leader in open banking. Um, great use cases and success stories with the HMRC capability to accept um, PIS for tax collections. However, really, I think other markets have really taken a lot of our blueprint um, and the fundamentals there and probably probably leapfrogged us, leapfrogged us now. Um, markets such as Australia, um, Brazil, and many of the Middle Eastern markets have introduced open finance, open data, and, and, and broader payment use cases from day one, which proves, I think, to everyone that the demand can be there. Um, and we really need to kind of go from fourth gear to, to fifth gear and, and move on to move on to phase two of open banking. So again, I'm going to pick, you know, just briefly to just, just three areas which I really hope comes out of, of the future of, of the future of payments review. Um, and uh, many of these are we've all talked about before, but I think is uh, I think it's really important we, we touch on them again to, to to kind of keep our fingers crossed that, that they turn the dial. Um, the first one is around around the commercial models. Um, one of the biggest areas of, of, of development, it, it needs to be an equitable commercial model for the open banking ecosystem. There is a, a recognition that the current kind of free model um, for TPPs to access bank APIs is just, it's just not sustainable. There's that mm. fine balancing act um, to develop a model that balances the risk and allies incentives for, for the various parties across the ecosystem. And, and, and you know, JROC supports the development of VRPs beyond sweeping. And there's a working group right now to establish and build out those non-sweeping use cases um, to continue to develop what the commercial model and, and the use of those premium APIs and can, can work. So we continue to, to adopt and pilot those. Secondly, and this is a, I love this topic, is, is the much discussed challenge of really consumer protection and dispute resolution. It's, it's often used as the uh, the excuse or, or, or whatever that we, we it's not getting the uptake that we want uh, and it's being worked on right now and, and JROC's obviously working on it to develop a system for open banking payments to provide that appropriate level of of consumer protection and dispute resolution that protects everybody in the ecosystem we know cards have chargebacks um credit cards offer other um purchase protection dds have the indemnity claims etc um, but the working group needs to continue to explore and define appropriate protection for open banking payments. The, there's a big piece around liability models and a balance between payment protection and purchase protections that needs to be developed. Again, a bit like financial inclusion, a real strong customer awareness around this, especially for a country who's so um, sticky to, to the use of our cards. And what we need to remember is that an appropriate protection model can also help um, payments tackle the fight against fraud, going to what Paul talked about earlier, in particular APP fraud. As open banking payments, you know, as we know, consumers don't need to enter their sensitive data um, as it's pre-populated, and also it's then backed up by the, the strong customer authentication in, in the app itself. The third issue uh, is to look at define the governance and funding model for the future of open banking. The, the provision of the, the central directory and central reporting on performance um, is one of the hallmarks of the UK open banking ecosystem. However, it's also become clear that the sole funding of the central infrastructure by the CMI9 is just, it's just not sustainable. Whilst we need to have some proportionate funding that makes sense for the large players who have the highest volumes, obviously, a more fair and equitable model across the ecosystem will really promote the right incentives for people to engage. And I think if we get that right, all these three priorities plus the other ones um, will allow the longer term development of open banking, but it also must be designed in a way not to restrict um, going into other industries for open banking, open data, finance, into to energy, et cetera. And I'm really hoping from this, Tony, we see some real clear timelines um, about the requirements for different industries to providing their data into the open ecosystem. You're on mute, Tony. Rookie error. 
<laughs> um, I, I love I love the other love that particular point and the, uh, your way of describing those three themes. I think is really helpful. Now we're going to go on. Now um, Jana McIntosh, um, who leads uh, payments and innovation at uh, UK Finance, um, we've we've had a. Um, uh, a, a brilliant uh, connection between uh, our respective communities on this and many other things. And so Jan is a, a guest today, and thank you for for collaborating so practically. We've we speak a, a lot about um, some of these topics, um, not too much so much to ensure alignment, but to ensure ensure that there is a common direction. And certainly there is uh, between the UK finances goals and ours. So Jan, I've decided that because you are the guest, I give you the toughest to topic. <laughs> <laughs> about regulation and compliance. Uh, so what, what do you think should be in the future papers review on these two topics? How are we going to unravel the spaghetti? Oh, yes. Well, thank you very much, Tony, for having me. Um, and it is always a delight to kind of partner with the uh, Bend Association and collaborate with your members. Um, well, it certainly is a very big bowl of dense and kind of sticky spaghetti that we are trying to deal with at the moment um, when it comes to uh, the kind of regulatory uh, agenda that we are facing into um you know at UK finance we did a piece of work uh, before joe garner's review was announced to try and look at the delivery roadmap and really understand what can we do to make a bit more sense of it what can we do to kind of make sure that we end up in the right place and it ended up being uh, a very good piece of work that informed uh, the discussions with joe as well because when you look at all of this and you look at kind of the uk market the portfolios of initiatives that we do have individually all make sense. These are important things that we do need to kind of consider. And if we get it right, it certainly will enhance our kind of UK ecosystem uh, and in particular kind of our kind of uh, customer journeys and the services that we provide to customers and businesses in the UK. Uh, and in fact, many successes. I mean, we do need to kind of pause and think about it. We've had many, many successes in the UK market. Um, it is an attractive place to operate. It's an attractive place for businesses to set up. It is a fantastic place to kind of innovate and collaborate. Um, uh, and certainly kind of uh, something I've always said uh, is that, you know, regulation in the UK is a strength. You know, we have a very complicated and potentially kind of maybe too, too dense regulatory kind of structure and framework that we are facing into. Um, but it certainly has uh, been a strength and kind of helped us evolve the market that we do have. Um, you know, the way that kind of the regulation has allowed firms to come in to stand on their own feet and get their licenses, the way that we kind of think about partnering with the regulators on the innovation agenda. There are many, many, many things that we can kind of think about in that space. Um, however, if you look at this roadmap, um, and all of the activities on there, I think there is a kind of instinctive desire at the moment to kind of, in part, kind of protect our resilience and, able, and, our, and our ability to kind of like deliver on this roadmap. And in particular, how we do that alongside the regulators, you know, how do we balance and rethink our industry led approach to some of these initiatives? Um, when we looked at the roadmap and we kind of gathered um, some evidence and information for Joe, um, we kind of like analysed the roadmap items and identified that over 90% of all of the initiatives that we deliver at the moment in the UK are regulatory led. Um, and, and if you look at the, the spend that kind of like we're putting into delivering those, um, you know, that's between 10 and 20 billion um, of industry spend um, to kind of advance and ultimately kind of deliver this roadmap for the next five years. Um, and the spend mm. of the time and the kind of regulatory involvement is not the problem the difficulty is that it is crowding out uh, the pace of change and innovation and I think that is where people are kind of getting really concerned about it um, the other thing that we try to kind of focus on is that point around setting all of that aside if we've delivered this what have we achieved what are the outcomes that we are really kind of aiming for um, and I think that is where we can be uh, more specific we can be more targeted we can be more focused um, uh, and I mean, many, many would know, and, and I've spoken about this in kind of many previous capacities, but I've been a regulator myself. And I think this relationship with industry um, is immensely important. Um, the way that we kind of bring expertise and views to the table and the way that we kind of work together on agendas, um, you know, can only kind of help us end up in the right place. Um, you know, this is never a conversation about uh you know industry kind of like going at its own or kind of not needing the regulators to intervene or the regulators doing all of it and the industry being responsive i think it is about kind of striking that balance and making sure that we all bring to the table uh what is ultimately necessary to kind of affect that change and there are many places where we honestly and truly kind of value um and kind of need the regulators to kind of help us move things forward paul talked about fraud so i'm not going to rehash all of that 
But the fraud agenda and protecting consumers is always going to front of mind. Um, you know, we are living in, a, in an era and a kind of in a space and time when fraud is a real is a real problem. And as we kind of move into a more digital world, um, we are going to have to face into that more and more so. But as kind of Paul alluded to, the difficulty that we face at the moment is by all of that being regulatory driven, by us not kind of thinking through some of the consequences, by us not kind of thinking through that risk paradox, again, that kind of Paul uh, and David Postings re referred to, we kind of create a risk in another place because a lot of the initiatives, again, are kind of driven, driven through regulatory change, um, which means that the systems that we need uh, to kind of deliver this through are too congested. Um, the kind of pace at which we can roll out the tools that we need to develop to kind of help manage the fraud we can't deliver as fast as we potentially need to um, you know kind of like other places where we work with the regulators certainly and where we we value their input is around standards and interoperability um, you know the Bank of England's done some fantastic work on ISO 2022 uh, when we work with them on the digital pound um, you know the interoperability of programmable money in the future is going to be essential um, and the role that they can play in kind of like helping us navigate that collectively um, would be fantastic. Uh, the regulators certainly can help us focus on outcomes. As difficult as the consumer duty has been, um, it is a principles-based, outcomes-focused piece of regulation, which is which is mm -hmm. great. That is the space that we really need to operate in. It gives us a little bit more flexibility as an industry to think things through. We need the regulators to help us with market access um, and kind of like how does that we in particular kind of stay focused on um, you know, EU access um, and how we remain integrated, payments cross-border, um, and certainly the regulators through the G20 roadmap, through the work that we are doing um, with h and um, absolutely fantastic. So there's, there are loads of places where I think we can, we can kind of use that combined effort and kind of benefit with the regulators to kind of work together. But I think the one thing that we desperately need is a little bit of space to innovate. We need a little bit of flexibility where it is that we can kind of focus on delivering things that we know our customers want um, and where we can kind of like help do that and a complement to the regulatory program. I love that. Yeah, let's, let's carve out some space to innovate. And I can imagine everybody around the table is, is going to be saying yes to that. Thank you very much indeed, Jan. That was very succinct and helpful. And now the penultimate area we want to look at is, is cross-border. And Laura McCracken, an international uh, citizen of the world, is going to uh, reflect on that um, in light of her experience at Facebook, Amex, Amazon, um, uh, Accenture. Um, uh, Laura, please go ahead. Thank cross -border. you. Thank you. Yes, um, cross border. We've been um, we've been challenged with a lot of issues across border for the last couple of decades, right? Um, cross border industry is approximately 156 trillion as of 2023, and we're expecting that to grow to 100. I'm sorry, 230 trillion dollar market globally around the world, and that's a conservative estimate. So the opportunity is massive. And there are so many pain points. We had a couple of roundtables with the Payments Association over the last couple of weeks where we kind of delved into what our members are really finding as their key pain points. And of course, these pain points are centering around one speed because we've moved into a world where people expect real time, they expect instant. And the speed of, of cross-border transactions continues to be very long, five to 10 days. If you're looking at a lot of different uh, transactions cross-border, but it can be much longer when you have additional regulations in certain either sending or receiving markets. Uh, the second thing that people talk about is transparency, uh, really understanding um, where the funds are at any given point in time and also the cost of those of the, of the transaction. And the cost, the cost is still quite expensive. So there's still room to innovate and bring the, the cost down on cross-border. Um, so those are the three areas. And, and we'll, when we think about solutions, they come all around again, kind of three areas. One, data harmonization. Everyone talks about the need for data harmonization. I learned a new uh, term last week called poo payments. Uh, payments originated overseas, and they're the biggest pain point for us in the UK. People trying to poo payments, love it. Poo payments. I love it. Poo payments. I, it was a <laughs> it's a new word for me. I learned something new every day. And uh, really, it's about um, being able to have the right fields, the right data, um, as people are bringing money into the UK. And I'm sure it's the same when we send money out uh, to be able to harmonize the say SEPA payments with faster payments, etc. Uh, the second thing is really around um, AML, 
and KYC. And that becomes more and more complicated as, as we have a constantly shifting geopolitical landscape. So with anti-terrorism financing uh, threats, with uh, money laundering and the constantly changing regulation on KYC and KYB, that's a massive pain point. And it's hard for companies to keep up and even when you, a lot of people just don't understand it. You know, I'm amazed about how many people, they think that they're experts, but they still, you, if you've, even if you talk to the experts, they can't really uh, pin it down for you uh, about where it is today and where it's moving and how it might change. And, and lastly, that just the transparency. And I'll just say, but I'll just kind of wrap up where the solutions are coming from. You know, we kind of, I think of us as having kind of three players you know you've got the traditional players that are trying to come up with solutions and those are the the correspondent banking networks uh the schemes uh swift uh now the fintechs and digital banks that are trying to come up with solutions to improve the the cross-border payment that we experience today both commercially and, and retail um but you also have big tech entering the frame and think about the, the failed attempt at Meta to launch Libra. Uh, think about how Elon Musk is trying to turn Twitter, which is now X, into the next global PayPal and super app. Uh, think about Microsoft, think about Apple. So all of these big tech players are recognizing the huge potential, like I said, 230 trillion. They're recognizing the opportunity, they're recognizing the pain points, and they're trying to think of how can we solve the problem? So, and then you've got blockchain and Ripple as also new players or um, you know, digital currencies around the world, Bitcoins, those are potential new players. And what I think that this, this tension between the traditional and the new players is actually bringing, uh, waking up the central banks and the central banks and governors, governments are realizing we've got to get, we've got to fix this before kind of big tech fixes it for us. So I'm really, I'm excited about, you know, as Ricardo talked about the banks, uh, central banks looking at CBDCs and governments thinking about how they can uh, develop not only their own um, uh, CBDCs, but also working with alliances around the world. So anyway, that's, uh, that's me done. Uh, it's very exciting space. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Laura. And it's, I must say, I, I think uh, tension doesn't necessarily mean conflict. Tension, I believe, is, is an enabler of innovation and can lead to, lead to lasting change. Um, and I, I, I'm, I would encourage and, and support that. So thank you. The, the last of the seven areas, remember, these are the corresponding areas that our community has said is, is, a, is a areas of concern to us. And we have a project group, or in fact, they're called working groups now, that are there to... Um, to, to bring our community members together and work on these. If any of our members are out there and want to be involved with any of the themes that you've heard today, please do uh, let your member engagement uh, exec or manager know and be happy to get you involved. And the final area is an area that in the scheme of things is probably the most important. I'm just going to touch on it briefly is um, ESG. And, uh, you know, the industry is, is committed to making sure that... Um, that our products reflect their impact on the world around us and making sure that um, ESG journeys, so those are consistent with that sort of objective, are, are commonplace. Um, and there's half a dozen areas that we think are important that we're hoping are going to be reflected in the future of payments review. Um, and, and really, I hope that these aren't left out because they're seen as being the soft factors. In a way, these this is where the rubber really does hit the road. Um, of the half a dozen areas, the ones I want to pick out are, um, first of all, but professionalizing payments. Uh, we want to raise uh, standards through education and training of all payments people to make sure that um, they're really very aware of how payments works and how they can make the most of it. Uh, we want to encourage a, a, a talent pool, a resource of, of individuals that is diverse, you know, flexible, um, and, and create a dynamic employment market uh, that reflects both the leveling up of gender and, and, and also differences in, in gender and sexuality, um, uh, race, age, religion, and, and disability, of course. Uh, we will actually want to increase um, uh, the, the quality of the pool of talent in our industry, partly through education, and but also by, by, um, by attracting people from outside it, and especially those who live outside uh, London and the Southeast. 
Um, and one of the ways we're going to do that is we're going to uh, champion, we'd like to champion an, an apprenticeship program that um, actually creates opportunities for people who wouldn't otherwise engage with our industry. How many times do you go home at night and you have a chat with somebody and they say, what industry are you in? And you say, well, I'm in payments. And they say, huh? What's payments? So let's make payments a bit more of an attractive place to be. Um, and I, again, look, the last thing I want to touch on is um, we'd really like to see an industry standard that would measure the environmental impact of, of payment uh, transactions, payment processing, and 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 we'd love to have at one point um, the payment associations members, at the very least, uh, setting ambitious targets to 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 achieve those within within two years. So that's the sort of area under ESG. So uh, to the audience, uh, we're now uh, about twenty minutes into our session. There's a theme I'd like to share with you, which is. Um, uh, to do with collaboration. We do believe there's a need to bring the industry together into some sort of uh, alliance to help with the prioritization and the direction of this. And, and Jana and I have agreed that if we can uh, get the support of the government, we're going to be looking at undertaking that. But I'd like to I'd like to move to the Q&As first. Um, uh, so those in the audience, uh, please do uh, pop your questions up. Um, I'm going to pop the first one uh, that was come from William Lorenz. Thank you for that, William. Um, the question is, how do we make sure this review has more real world impact than the previous Khalifa review, in particular, as the government is almost guaranteed to change next year? So uh, we will try and be apolitical. Uh, we believe that there is a, a goal bigger than politics here, if there is such a thing. Um, so who would like to start and touch on that? Who would like to share their experience of being of, of the Khalifa review and, and its impact? Tony, I don't, I don't mind jumping. I spoke to the CFIT team yesterday, actually, mm -hmm. about the, the work going on the Khalifa review. I think um, as ever, right. it's taken longer, it's taken longer than we'd like to start seeing the mobilisation. But Charlotte and the team, I think, are now starting to move on that activity. But the challenge, as ever, is it's a, it's a huge report. It's, it's it's really wide reaching. It's got lots of opportunity in that report, but it's funded for a limited period to get that up and running. And uh, you know, it's going to be a real tough ask to get enough mobilization against everything else that's going on. Picking the point that Jana picked up earlier, I think our change budget here in our payments team last year was over 90% of it was already subscribed to regulatory and mandatory work. And a lot of the, the Khalifa review is more forward looking about taking new value opportunities. And that's a very difficult thing to, to try and schedule into everything else that's already happening. So the question is a great question. I think we are slightly gummed up with so many opportunities that we can't we can't eat them all and um we've got to get clear on the priorities to make sure that we can drive the the the, the industry forward um because right now we we uh we we, we uh we're kind of this this wealth of opportunity in front of us is kind of hampering actually some of those really important movements thank you other other comments on this Tony, I'm, ha I'm happy to come in uh, as well. Um, it, is, it is a very interesting question, and to be honest, one that we've been asking ourselves all the way through engaging with Joe, uh, because in the conversations that we had even today, I think being in the industry and being so close to all the developments, we're very quick to identify the difficulties, but to really kind of identify the right solutions and drive those forward is incredibly hard. Um, and I think there is kind of something in this for me, which, you know, especially kind of facing into an election year next year, uh, uh, as I kind of talked about kind of like the relationship with regulators is for industry to kind of own this agenda a bit more is for us to not wait for someone else to necessarily solve that for us, not for us to kind of wait for someone else to come in and again, kind of dictate what that roadmap and that path looks like. I think there's a real opportunity for us to kind of show that leadership here um, where Joe's review could be helpful is kind of help us amplify the message, put payments right, right up front in terms of the contributions we can make, the benefits we can deliver to society, the support we can provide to growth and to kind of the political agenda, um, but we are really the experts that know what that looks like on the ground, what a good business case would look like that actually takes into account the commercialization that Peter talked about, that really addresses the kind of liabilities and the difficulties and fraud that Paul talked about. Um, you know, so if we can kind of like show that there is an ability for us to navigate this and then kind of pull in the support that we need from regulators and kind of government and kind of other areas, um, then you have a real opportunity to kind of make a success out of this and actually kind of like make um, a real difference over the next kind of five years. That's, that's really helpful. Um, any additions from uh, Peter, Peter, perhaps? Uh, 
Uh, okay, very good. Thank you. Great question. Um, so my, my views on this are, are, are absolutely aligned with Janus. I think there is a need for leadership. There's a question about whether the industry itself is, is capable of showing sufficient leadership in light of its very broad church, or whether in fact some higher power, and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to bring in religion here, Although sometimes I must say I am absolutely praying for for some some things to happen. Um, uh, I, I wonder whether my my gut feeling is that I would love and remember we're talking about the review report here, um, which by the way is the the, the future of payments review will be published on the twenty second of November. Um, we, we are we would really like to see within that some sort of clear strategic direction from the government uh, in the way in which perhaps Australia has a national strategy for payments. Perhaps we can have that too. But let's move on to the next question thank you very much indeed for that one that was great William uh, we've got a uh, two very similar ones popping in here I'm going to pop them both up there um, to do with the uh, the not so new payment architecture um, uh, sorry that's an old joke um, so the first one is let's, let's go with the first one looks like the NPA is getting delayed with no news on the vendor selection uh, what is the benefit for banks what revenue streams would the NPA open up for banks any initial views and Phil has kindly also thrown in this one which is um, what's the role of NPA given NPA's uh, given pay UK's um, latest comms that it won't go live until 26. Do we need a better strategic plan for the future? Well, perhaps that refers to my earlier point. Who would like to touch on that? Um, anybody who would like to make yeah, some... Yeah, um, maybe Tony, I'll just start, just to give Paul some time to think up uh, the, uh, <laughs> uh, the, the, bank, the bank answer for this. Um, you know, again, I think we need to keep <clears throat> quite, you know, apolitical in effect, but I think, you know, the payments, if you think about new payments architecture and, and the benefits of it, yes, we will get faster payments will get better resiliency etc um but i think the real benefits and why i think people will struggle with and where i think you know paul will probably come in is around the data side of this the real richness of the new payments architecture and not the real-time payment systems globally now is yes the payments go faster yes you know but me as a consumer goes you know kind of we've got a pretty fast system right now um the real richness and the gold um, and where product innovation can most likely happen more is around the ISO 2022 standard, which we will now have in place for that. Um, what that means for, especially for, for corporate customers, um, what can be done on reconciliations and accounts payable and accounts receivable. Um, I think the challenge there is unlocking that value. And there aren't you know, countries and other countries are ahead of us of this are struggle sometimes to kind of get the benefits immediately on, on that data, but it's probably more of a longer term play. Um, but but Paul, from a from a bank side and, and, and benefits, uh, I, I'm sure you've got a, a view on this as well. I've got plenty of views, Peter, but, but I can only give so many on this on this forum. <laughs> um, and, can, and, can, and can they be published? That's the question. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think we're all frustrated because uh, the work we did as an industry, the Payment Strategy Forum, a few years ago, to come up with the blueprint of how we saw the the ecology of payments developing, I think, starts to open up those value opportunities that have been talked about here, you know, on the back of the data opportunities that we'll get from ISO 2022 to drive new product innovation, to drive further customer protection. We'll go back to, we'll loop back to fraud again, you know, that ability to build in more information around purpose of payment, more information around the, the parties in the payment will really help with charting customer behavior and the and the interactions that go on so so we're all frustrated we we would want to be further advanced than we are today um, but I think one of the challenges we've got is life moves on as this process moves on and around us technology is changing expectations are changing um, you heard Laura talking about CBDC and many of us the banks have, have, have been very clear in our response to the CBDC consultation that we like the idea of the benefits it could bring to customers in terms of digital currency, but we'd like to do it in commercial bank money rather than central bank money. Now, some of the solutions to do that may well play in some of the same space as the MPA requirements. Now, what does that mean for the future? Because we're already spending a lot of money preparing for MPA. It's going to take a lot of investment to deliver MPA, but we need to deliver it in a world where we get the most value from that investment. So, so to loop back to Tony's point, that strategy of joining together is crucial for us because you know that in, that investment to give best outcome for customers means we've got to make best use of technology opportunities and delivery and not necessarily stick to you know something we may be put in the ground or put a plow on the ground six years ago you know that ground is now different ricardo comments on that to do with the digital currency innovation yeah, well, I think that, you know, uh, as you said, you started with this funny joke about MPA, not so not so new, uh, new payment system architecture. I think that, you know, it's important that 
this new infrastructure will come in a more uh, sort of you know in a bigger context which is that the, the new world that's changed when npa was thought through we couldn't see very well where the developments that are now available in payments are leading so i think that's key that whatever structure and um, infrastructure comes out of that is fully interoperable with the new payment solution that the market is driving, particularly on CBDCs and stable coins. Otherwise, we're going to build something new, but that's old. And I think that, Tony, this, this goes back to your <laughs> not so new NPA. This, this mm -hmm. is the thing, and also harmonization with uh, ISO and all of this. Uh, you know, we can't afford having something new that's already old. So it has to be well thought through in a bigger, in a bigger picture. And if I may say something controversial, I'm not really sure that we, we are, uh, we have been thinking of this uh, very carefully. So there are, of course, everyone is aware of this, but I think there's some more thinking has to be done. Okay, very good. Laura, from the merchant's perspective, how relevant is all of this? Well, coming from a big tech perspective, I mean, I think that the whole NPA um, idea was very ambitious. And I think I like ambition. I like thinking big. But I also think that um, I think there's frustration that it is it's not agile enough. So I think that we need to um, uh, strike the right balance between being ambitious and thinking big with with being a bit more agile and maybe because uh, I don't know if we're keeping up with um, innovation as as Ricardo said. You know, so I that there's just that sense of frustration on our side on the big tech side. Very good. Anybody else anything to add? Very good. So the next, the next question. Thank you. I, I, this is it's really difficult because the thing that I I find so fascinating is when you talk to the people involved with these various initiatives. We only we only looked at a I think we looked at eleven in the in flights initiative review. We looked at eleven of them. Um, each of them has a, an owner. Each of them has somebody who really is very keen on delivering them, who believes in them, who sought them through. They have a stake in them, and for somebody to turn around and say, look, actually. That's not for fit for purpose anymore. And and this train's coming. We should jump on that one. It's really hard. So you kind of need to have a um a kind of an overarching um strategy that you you can be evolved and 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 and, and used to shape and prioritize what we do and what we don't do. And what we don't do. Look, next question has come in from anonymous attendee. I love this one. Have you seen significant return on investments on the huge investments you've made in implementing payments compliance regulation over the last three years? If yes, please share examples. So, Paul, while you think about the examples, Jana, I'm going to you 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 chaired the uh, regulation piece. Um, what do you think? Do you think people are getting a good ROI? Oh, I mean, the honest answer is probably no. I'll let I'll let Paul kind of dig into the details, but it is really difficult at the moment to kind of justify the amount of money going into this change program. And I think back to the kind of previous conversation, there's a fundamental change in the way that we deliver the payments, which we need to start embracing, which is it has to kind of be more commercial. It has to have better business cases, you know, and the, the kind of investment change, arguably, that kind of goes into a lot of this, especially given that it is regulatory driven, maybe does not have the best business cases associated with it. Um, you know, individually, that is absolutely fine. But when you start kind of putting it together and things start kind of stepping on each other's toes and the individual business cases are maybe not alive to the wider ecosystem and the kind of spend happening in other places, then it becomes a real mess. And then it does reduce mm -hmm. the return on investment. Um, you know, it comes back to kind of like that trade-off. The longer things take to kind of like put in place, the more it's going to cost. And the more it's going to cost, the less return there's going to be. It's quite simple. So I think kind of we do need to kind of work that through on this roadmap. And it's not necessarily to stop some of these initiatives, but it is in part to kind of be more realistic and honest about what goes into these business cases and what we are asking the industry to deliver. You know, these things should not be viewed in isolation. You, you, the individuals, you're right, that may own these kind of roadmap items will have an ambition to deliver it, but it is incumbent on us to kind of like, as an industry, you know, really test that business case. But for those that develop those business cases, to not think that they're, they're only show and tan because they are not anymore. I think that, you know, we are living in the yeah. middle. I, th I think that's really well said. And Paul, um, uh, a Obviously minute or so thought this hard to Jana giving me time to go up with a different answer. <laughs> there isn't, a, there isn't a different answer, and I'm, and I'm in danger of giving you the story of, of Czech digitization again because that's a, a, a fantastic case study of um, the lack of business case, the huge amount of investment, and 
what is the return from a customer point of view? You know, or what we're going to see how, less and less how, how much we, infrastructure. How much did we spend as an industry? Well, look, if, if you look at what's spent at the centre, that's only part of the story. Um, so you're probably saying as an industry, we spent way over a billion pounds on digitising checks um, to, to do less service for customers. Um, yes, they've speeded up. Um, but, you know, the, the, the expectation of customers wasn't about speed. It was about the safety of that activity. And the political conversations that start of that whole debate really put us in a position where we were um, left to invest in something that really was not going to give our customers the value. If we could have invested that money elsewhere, I think we could have done a lot more good with that with that investment. But, you know, there was there was a political drive to answer a question and a perceived harm that we saw at the time, which um, I think, if you look back, is a is a sanguine lesson for the for the industry, and we need to learn those lessons. Peter, thirty seconds on this from you. Yeah, and I think just from a, I've helped a number of you know, banks and organisations globally try, try and hash together a business case for many of these. Um, one going to Yana's original point, uh, it's hard, and do they actually exist? And really, a lot of it is a longer term spin around availability, resilience, security, um, potential movements to the cloud, etc. And what cost efficiencies they can do. And it ends up being a five to ten year cost play or hopeful cost play. Um, because while you've got the bonnet up, what can we do to make our technology stacks more efficient? Um, is really a lot of the the, the business cases that are and whether that whether we actually get those benefits is a different matter but a lot of those factors as is, is kind of like you know how can we do justify that and and and, and some of those factors are, are used for that very good do you know we're just a couple of minutes away the, from the end it's it's amazing how quickly an hour goes when you're uh, talking about things you 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 love and you believe in uh, a great deal i'm just going to wrap up actually um comments have been hugely helpful um a few a few closing remarks for me um number one if you if you haven't if you haven't seen and read this please do the future of payments review building a world class sorry is it sorry the payments manifesto was that a Freudian slip this isn't the future of payments review <laughs> much as we like it to be um, but, but we hope world... that you will be in the future of payments review Tony so you will yes, we, 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 hope, <laughs> we hope so well, Building a world-class payments industry together, and that's you know that's uh, Jana and, and, and me and, and many others will be uh, cooking up a um, hopefully a, an alliance which takes us across the industry, which following the leadership of the government, which we hope is going to come through in uh, Joe Garner's report, which 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 actually reinforces and recognises the importance of our industry to the effective world economy in which we we live and society in which we live, but also the leadership of the UK. Um, I, Couple of things happening in the next few weeks. Um, on the 21st of November, Financial Crime 360. Uh, we have uh, um, uh, Anthony Brown, we have um, uh, Michael Mainelli, uh, the um, Lord Mayor of the City of London. Uh, we have um, uh, Chris Helmsley, we have many other great speakers there. Um, we also, um, the next day will be the government's uh, autumn statement at which we hope to see uh, the future of payments review published. Um, a week or so later, the industry is getting together to review it collectively, uh, which is going to be fantastic. Um, and then that gives us a bit of a pause, perhaps, until the end of the year. And in January, I want to hit the ground running with uh, bringing together something to help us to start to really prioritise, help the industry to prioritise what it does and, importantly, what it doesn't do. Uh, and we've, in, in the manifesto, we describe this as a, a, the, um, a Sprint Payments Alliance. Let's see whether that... Made it through right to the end. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.